You are listening to We Saw the Devil, an investigative and conversational true crime podcast that deep dives into fascinating criminal cases that are solved, unsolved, or ongoing. From America's Lori Vallow to Jeremy's Armin Mivas, we examine and discuss the world's most shocking cases. If you're enjoying the show, don't forget to follow us online. Check us out at WeSawTheDevil.com and we saw the Devil on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. And don't forget, you can become part of the show by backing us on Patreon. Nearly one in three women and one in six men have experienced stalking victimization at some point in their lifetime. More than half of all victims of stalking indicated that they were stalked before the age of 25, and nearly one in four were stalked before the age of 18. For this episode, we're going to talk about stalking, methods, the technology used to stalk, famous stalking cases, anti-stalking legislation, as well as what you can do to keep yourself as safe as possible. You are listening to We Saw the Devil. I'm your host, Robin. And let's just go ahead and get the quick housekeeping out of the way. You can find our website at wesawthedevil.com. From there, you can find us across all social media channels, Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, the whole bit there, as well as our Patreon. Again, for everyone who has been listening, Patreon is still suspended in terms of payment, uh, except for current patrons, not for new patrons. I will keep you all updated in terms of when that changes, but as of right now, all payments are suspended for current patrons. And as always, if you're liking the show, loving it, digging it, please take just five seconds out of your day to leave a five-star review on iTunes uh, or whatever platform that you're listening to, not only for this podcast, but for any podcast that you're listening to that you enjoy. It means the world to content creators and lets us know what we're doing right and what we are doing wrong. So please take time to do that uh, to support. But let's just go ahead and get right into the episode here. This is something that I've been thinking about quite a bit. You know, when it was released that Brian Koberger repeatedly surveilled that King Road home where he would go on to butcher four innocent students, I think it disturbed pretty much all of us. The thought of him dressed in black, staked out in his Elantra, or crouching in the shadows in some nearby bushes— the thought is beyond terrifying. And there's also been a handful of high-profile cases where stalking took place. And not only that, but while preparing for this episode, I reached out to a a few female friends and made an open call for stories on my own personal Facebook. The sheer number of women who have experienced stalking at some point in their lives was shocking to say the least and absolutely tracks with the actual statistics. You know, in my friends' cases, and also mine, the perpetrator was an ex-boyfriend or an ex-acquaintance. Luckily, in most of these cases, it didn't actually escalate to a physical violence. But that doesn't mean that the experience left anyone without trauma. And as time moves on, so does technology. Methods change. You know, Michael Myers standing outside of the shrubs of Laurie Strode's house in the movie Halloween or outside of her school just watching and waiting. That's what so many people envision when they think of stalking, borderline horror movie. The act of physically going to a location and surveilling and observing, silently and anonymously. But that's not necessarily the only method that stalkers utilize to harass and surveil their victims. And I think the Brian Koberger Moscow, Idaho case bothered me just so badly, especially after the PCA, the probable cause affidavit came out, is that he had been surveilling these girls for months, I believe starting in mid-August, as far as his cell phone pinging on a cell tower near the King Road home. It's recently come out by People magazine that he followed three of the female victims who he would go on to murder, allegedly murder. So... And what I'm what I'm just flabbergasted by too is the sheer volume, the sheer content that all of us, myself included, I am just as guilty of this, of the personal details that we are constantly putting on our social media. Even if we think it's friends only or just random internet people that we, you know, vibe with, the sheer amount of data that's going online is terrifying. And I was sitting there thinking about it and I'm like, okay, 
let's say that Brian Koberger went into the Mad Greek restaurant. He encountered Zana and Maddie. Okay. He had their first names. How would someone be able to locate who they are, where they live, so on and so forth? It's not that difficult. A very small town like that, the the restaurant probably has an Instagram or Facebook. It would be just as easy to log on to one of those pages, one of those social media pages, whether Instagram or Facebook, go through the people who have liked posts, identify, say, if Maddie liked or Zana liked a post from the restaurant. You know, that's their workplace. They have every right to support them if they love working there. Boom. That's it. There's the first and last name. Google search. There's your address. Or surveilling and watching them and watching where they go. And it's just so terrifying that that is what the world has come to. And speaking to, again, some of my uh, female friends who have been victims of this, they've been followed home. Maybe you've been followed home or followed in a car by someone. Um, But with the technology available today, which we will get absolutely into here, into some of this later on in the episode, it's terrifying. And law enforcement and the laws surrounding, surrounding stalking aren't necessarily actually keeping up with it. And if you actually know about some of the legislation that's been passed and how difficult it is to even get an order of protection for someone who's exhibiting some of these behaviors, it's, it's just bizarre to me. So we're going to cover a lot of this. So for this episode, we're going to get into the nitty gritty of it all. And we're going to begin by simply defining stalking. What is it exactly? And that's actually hard to say because the definition differs against countries, across states, jurisdictions, all of it. But according to the Stalking Prevention Awareness and Rescue Center, a good just working definition is a pattern of behavior directed at a specific person that would cause a reasonable person to fear for their safety or the safety of others or suffer substantial emotional distress. Stalking is a crime in all 50 U.S. states, as well as the District of Columbia and U.S. territories. Wonderful news, right? Like, yay, we we have a, a bare understanding of stalking. It is a crime in all 50 states. But what if I told you that fewer than a third of U.S. states classify stalking as a felony in all circumstances? More than half of U.S. states classify it as a felony on the second or subsequent offense, or when it involves an aggravating factor. Uh, An aggravating factor can be the perpetrator uh, possessing a gun or a deadly weapon, the stalking violation, uh, uh, violating their probation or parole, the violation of a court order, or if the victim is under the age of 16. There's a lot yet to be accomplished on the legal and law enforcement side of stalking, but again, more on that later. Some behaviors that are seen with stalking would be vandalizing uh, the victim's property, stealing from the victim or breaking into and then burglarizing their home, threatening the victim, killing or harming pets as a way to get revenge or attention, following the victim, waiting outside their home or place of business, visiting the the person at work, sending them uh, cards or gifts, unwanted, sending them photographs of them that have been taken with or without consent or knowledge, leaving telephone, text, email, or handwritten messages for them, monitoring their internet history or computer usage. Remember back in the 80s and 90s, you know, one of the big things is the the heavy breather phone calls, annoying phone calls or other forms of harassment via phone. That's stalking. You know, using technology to gather information or victims of the uh, or pictures of the victims, such as going on social media and combing through all available uh, information that you can get on them, compiling it and then trying to identify where they are, location, things like that. Disclosing to the victim personal information that they have learned about them and then or their daily activities, you know, and interests like. I know that you go here every Friday, um, you're really digging down into their personal routine, disseminating personal information about the victim to other people, telling other people their uh, intricate life details, violating the terms of a protective order against them. 
We see that a lot in family law and domestic violence situations where or, a, you know, a girl breaks up with her boyfriend and uh, he will not take no for an answer. And he keeps coming after her and coming after her and upping the ante. And eventually she gets a, a protective order against him and he still breaks it. Unfortunately, a lot of times that ends in violence. And as we have seen repeatedly, especially those who follow true crime as a whole, ends in murder or, f- or f- a fatality. And finally, assaulting the victim, whether that is physical or sh- sexual violence, that is unfortunately um, sometimes what it amps up to. Now, the vast majority of stalking victims are, in fact, stalked by someone they know, uh, 40% or so by a current or former intimate partner, and then 42% by an acquaintance. So already there, we have 82% accounted for, roughly. Again, typically, it is uh, a friend of theirs, uh, someone that they've met, they are aware of, that they may have rejected, or uh, someone who shows interest in them, and then the other 40% by an intimate partner. 11% of stalking victims have been stalked for five years or more. Five years or more. That is a heinous amount of time. More than twice as many victims are stalked with technology than without, such as trackers or uh, key vloggers, things like that, surveillance, cameras. And if you want to hear a chilling statistic, Two out of every three stalkers typically pursue their victims at least once per week, many actually daily during that week, uh, using more than one of the methods that I just mentioned. So in terms of Brian Koberger and at least the information that we have so far of him going, you know, a couple times a month, he's actually in the minority in terms of stalking. He actually stalked at a lower frequency than two out of every three stalkers. So as freaked out and disturbed as we are by his behavior, knowing that he went on to murder these poor children, more stalkers proportionately stalk more frequently. And 78% of stalkers as a whole use more than one tactic. So they are utilizing the following, the phone calls, the harassment, the threats, use of technology. Weapons are used in only one out of five cases. And psychologically speaking, one out of every three stalkers has actually stalked before. So in terms, and I hate bringing it back to this every single time, but in terms of Brian Koberger, it would not be surprising at, say, roughly, what, 33.33% or so um, to realize that he may have stalked someone else before, depending. That being said, again, to the earlier point, intimate partner stalkers, ones say ex-husband, ex-boyfriend, ex-wife, ex-girlfriend, but let's be honest, it's usually, unfortunately, let's keep it real, uh, men who stalk women, intimate partner stalkers are the most likely, that is the most likely category of stalkers to approach, threaten, and then actually physically harm the victim. So we've identified what stalking is and some of the behaviors in the umbrella that it covers. But research and studies on this have actually identified four items, like four areas, uh, for a subset of different types of stalkers, different motives, different reasoning behind stalking. And there are four of them. The first and most common is called simple obsessional. Again, this is the most common type of stalker. They're usually male And they focus on stalking an ex-wife, an ex-lover, a former boss, uh, most frequently seen in intimate relationships. It typically starts before the breakup occurs when they know that it's on the downhill slide. And it, a lot of the times it's the, this, the stalker, the perpetrator in this feels like they've been mistreated in some way by the victim. The second type is love obsessional. In this type of stalking, the stalker is a stranger or a casual, very, very casual acquaintance to that victim. That doesn't matter, though, because the stalker then becomes obsessed and begins a pattern of behavior as a means of making the victim aware of his or her existence. One of the biggest cases off the top of my head would be Polly Perrette. If any of you guys remember her, she was on the show NCIS. She played Abby, the goth crime lab girl. I mean, that's a, that was a huge show. In 2015, she was out walking uh, by her home in Hollywood, and a man attacked her. 
she was walking in the street by her home in Hollywood when he literally just came out and grabbed her. Uh, he apparently kept punching her in the face, telling her his name, which his name is William Merck, and he kept telling her that he was going to kill her. There was a nearby parking garage, and she later recounted that she was just glad that he didn't drag her into the empty parking garage and rape her. She thought that she was going to die. So she, when a, another man who was walking his dog came by, um, she kind of kicked into gear. She immediately grabbed the paper and uh, sketched an outline of what the uh, assailant looked like. And he was actually a homeless man. He was severely mentally ill. The police did go on and arrest him. So, okay, traumatic as fuck for her. She ended up... Um, you know, going into therapy, going, she would go on to say that she was in a downward spiral. Uh, she became suicidal. It was very, 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 very traumatic uh, in many, many different ways. Not only just her home being invaded, her home space, because that was right outside of her home. But three years later in 2018, he was actually released. And what did he do? He actually came back for her and kept trying to uh, contact her. She went to the police and said, hey, I'm afraid of my computer. I'm afraid to open it. I'm afraid to check my emails. I just, I'm not doing okay. And so she went to the police and said, hey, what can I do about this? He's out. Like, I'm scared for my safety. And in an, out, in an interview with 48 Hours, she said, quote, I was told by a police officer that I should have stayed and let my stalker break my arms so that they would have something to prosecute. And as you're going to see from this episode, that is a very common response from police. This person is following you everywhere you go and making you uncomfortable. I'm sorry, until they do something physically to you or commit a crime, we can't do anything. For her, this ordeal was so traumatic that she pretty much more or less broke um, up with acting. She left in 2018, right around the time that he was released from prison. She was terrified and in a downward spiral, not doing very well. She does appear to be much better these days. Unfortunately, she suffered a stroke, side note, back in 2021. Uh, but she is very, very, very loud um, and vocal on civil rights and, and whatnot on Twitter. She is very much an activist, and I, I adore her very, very much for that. But her entire ordeal was absolutely terrifying. Then you have Selena Gomez. If you guys recall, she had a stalker. Her stalker actually broke into the guest house of her California home multiple times. He was ordered to stay away from her for a decade and to go under um, undergo psychological treatment. She actually had to move because he tried so many times and actually broke into her home three separate occasions. And one of the biggest cases was Jodie Foster. Um, I don't know how many people, especially the older gen. Sorry, I'm not even that old, but I'm like the you you young whippersnappers. If you guys recall, Jodie Foster actually had one of the well, most well known cases of celebrity stalking. John Hinckley Jr. became obsessed with her after he saw her in the movie Taxi Driver. She was she was super young. I mean, she was a young teenage girl at that point. So she ended up uh, going on to Yale, and he actually enrolled in Yale just to get close to her. He would put notes underneath her uh, door, stalk her, follow her around campus. And he decided that he needed to make an ultimate gesture to prove his love for her. So what did he do? He attempted to assassinate her. Ronald Reagan, the president in 1981. He went up to Ronald Reagan, again, the president of the United States, and shot him in the chest. And if a lot of you, I mean, go on and you can go onto YouTube right now and see the video of this happening. Um, Ronald Reagan got fucked up. And uh, can you imagine if uh, Obama, Biden, Trump, someone walked up to them and shot them at point blank range in the chest solely to quote unquote prove their love? Of a celebrity. Again, in 2015, Taylor Swift, one of the most p powerful uh, female artists in the world, she had to deal with a stalker named Frank Edward Hoover. He was absolutely deranged. He was batshit. He sent her letters. He sent letters to Taylor Swift's father, to her father. He said that he was going to kill her entire family. He said that he was the real son of God and that she was a sinner that her family was, quote, the evil family of devils. He was arrested in 2016 and then sentenced to a decade of probation in 2018. So he's out. He was sentenced to probation just a couple years ago. So he is out and, you know, doing well. Jennifer Lopez, another, another person. Um, 
her stalker, if this doesn't make you lose sleep, I don't know what uh, what would. He broke into her home. His name was John Dubis. Broke into her home and was able to live in her external guest house for a week before anyone was able to detect him or know that he was there. He lived in her compound for a full week before anyone knew that he was there. Thankfully, they did in fact locate him and they did in fact send him off for psychological evaluation because holy shit, that is terrifying. Gwyneth Paltrow was stalked for over 10 years. Dante Michael Sue sent her over 65 gifts within six years, including uh, letters, love letters, threats, pornography. He was finally attempt, uh, charged of, uh, he was found guilty of attempted stalking and then also a felony stalking charge. Sandra Bullock had a home invasion back in 2014. Joshua Corbett broke into her home with a loaded handgun. Thankfully, police were able to make it to the house and they were able to take him away and no one was harmed. However, she has been very outspoken about the fact that it left her with immense PTSD. And I could go on and on. Uh, Rihanna, Ashley Tisdale, uh, Teresa Saldana. uh, The list goes on and on and on and on. Christina Gemme. If you recall her, she was, you know, early on, uh, she was a YouTube star who then uh, went on to be on The Voice. She got really, really far on The Voice. And she was only 22 years old when at a show in Orlando in 2016, a man named Kevin James uh, Lobel went up and shot her at point blank range in front of the crowd. He had a, quote, unhealthy infatuation with her and was completely obsessed with her. He ended up shooting himself after he shot her. The list goes on and on and on, but this type of stalking is does is in fact seen, um, you know, love obsessional with high profile celebrity cases. However, it can be seen with the average citizen, but love obsessional uh, is typically seen more so, or is at least more so known for um, celebrity and higher profile people. Third type of stalking is erotomania. In that type of stalking, they incorrectly believe that the victim is in love with them and that for some whatever reason, there's an external barrier or interference that they would be together. So given that the stalker has this perceived love between them and the victim, uh, they actually pose a risk to the people close to the victim. Uh, Say they fall in love with someone and for some reason, psychologically, they believe her husband or her best friend or her parents or family, that someone is keeping her from being his partner, his lover. Those people could very much be in danger, but it's very much where a stalker incorrectly believes the victim is in love with him and or her and is being kept from them for some reason. And then finally, the fourth is a false victimization syndrome. This is where an individual who either consciously or subconsciously seeks to play the role of the victim. So this person may invent a detailed, intricate tale in which they claim to be stalking a victim. In reality, the would-be victim is the actual stalker, and the actual stalker is actually the real victim. Um, That's very, very, very rare to see. Very, very rare to see. You know, this person may be surveil, um, surveilling the victim's house, you know, five days, or they may uh, find themselves going to the person's work or following them into the grocery store. And then the actual victim is like, stop following me. And they're like, well, I'm just here. Why are you following me? Very, very, very rare. But that is a fourth time uh, kind of stalking. Now, back in 2009, a group of six psychologists banded together and began to study this. They said, surely there's a better way to um, do like risk assessment. So they wrote a book titled The Stalking Risk Profile, Guidelines for Assessing and Managing Stalkers. And between them, across the areas of forensic psychiatry, general treatment, and clinical focus on stalking, they decided to create a system that would better assist victims of stalking in risk assessment. And I find this just absolutely fascinating. So we're actually going to go through uh, their categories word for word here and discuss the different types. Unfortunately, without uh, you know buying their course and going through the actual full uh, program, which they do also offer for law enforcement as well. Uh, ideally, its uh, its intention is to best assist law enforcement 
and professionals with how at risk the victim is, um, you know, assessing the actual risk to the victim. So they actually came up with multiple categories, five of them to be exact. And again, we have the commonly agreed upon uh, four category, the simple obsessional, love obsessional, erotomania, and false victimization syndrome. Again, these are the largest umbrella of stalking categories and behind the motives of why a stalker may stalk others. The subset that I'm going to discuss now, again, was created by the six psychologists who did this in terms of best assessing risk. So we're going to start. The very first one is called the rejected stalker. Rejected stalking arises in the context of a breakdown of a close relationship. So the victims are usually former sexual intimates. However, though, sometimes family members, close friends, or others with a very close relationship to the stalker can also become the targets. It doesn't necessarily mean a sexual or romantic or intimate relationship. The initial motivation of a rejected stalker is either attempting to reconcile the relationship or to exacting revenge for a perceived slight or rejection. In many cases, rejected stalkers present as ambivalent about the victim and sometimes appear to want the relationship back, but at other times they're angry and want revenge and want a punitive retaliation against the victim. In some cases of the protracted stalking, the behavior is maintained because it becomes a substitute for the past relationship. So uh, stalking the victim allows the stalker to continue to feel close to them. Sick, right? Um, In other cases, the behavior happens because it allows the stalker to salvage the damage, uh, salvage their self-esteem, their damaged self-esteem. If they took a particularly big ego hit, it helps them feel better about themselves to and more powerful uh, to see the victim, uh, their ex, uh, whoever, scared. Category two is the resentful stalker. Resentment, resentful stalking happens when the stalker feels as though they have been mistreated or that they are the victim of some form of injustice or humiliation. Victims of this type are strangers or acquaintances who are seen to have mistreated them. It can also arise out of a severe mental illness when they develop paranoid beliefs about the victim, and they use the stalking as a way of getting back at them. The initial motivation for stalking is the desire for revenge or to, quote, even the score. And then the stalking is maintained by the sense of power and control that they get from inducing fear in the victim. A lot of the time, uh, resentful stalkers present themselves as a victim who is justified in their behavior because, again, they were slighted. Type number three is the intimacy-seeking stalker. These types, of stalk- these types of stalkers arise out of a context of loneliness. They're lonely and they lack a close partner or friend or relationship. The victims of intimacy-seeking stalkers are usually strangers or very loose acquaintances who become the, the, the target of the stalker in their desire. So, Frequently, intimacy-seeking stalkers' behavior is fueled by severe mental illness involving delusions that they have about the victim themselves, such as the fact that they are already in a relationship, even though uh, one doesn't exist. Again, erotomania uh, from the original one. This very much ties into this model as well. Intimacy-seeking from this group of psychologists with a risk assessment is the same as erotomania. Again, we see this with a lot of uh, celebrity cases of stalkers who are severely mentally ill have paranoid delusions and believe that they are actually in a relationship with that person. So the initial motivation of this type of stalking is to establish that emotional connection and an intimate relationship with the victim. The stalking is maintained by the gratification that comes from the belief that they are in fact closely closely linked to their victim. Sending them gifts, uh, visiting them in their home, breaking into their home, so on and so forth. It's terrifying. Fourth type is the incompetent suitor. The incompetent suitor stalks in the context of loneliness or loneliness or lust and targets both strangers or acquaintances. And it's actually, I know it sounds similar, but it is unlike the intimacy seeker because their initial motivation is not to establish a relationship, but to get date or sex, sexual relationship. That's the incompetent suitor. They usually stalk for brief periods, but when they do persist, their behavior is usually maintained by the fact that they are blind or indifferent to the distress or the victim. 
basically they don't care how disturbed or fearful the victim is. They want their end goal of a relationship or sex. Uh, again, this has a lot to do with mental illness, um, l- cognitive limitations, poor social skills. Um, and I'm, I hate saying this, but this is part of an academic study, but the incompetent suitor, uh, does based on this particular, uh, studies research show a lot of links to autism spectrum disorders, uh, or intellectual disabilities. And last but not least, we have the predatory stalker. The predatory stalker arises in the context of deviant sexual practices and interests. They are usually male, and the victims are almost always female strangers in whom they have a sexual interest. So the stalking behavior itself is usually initiated as a way of obviously getting some sexual gratification, uh, voyeurism, uh, targeting one or two uh, victims over amount of time. Um, they can also try to get information about the victim. Um, a lot of the time, this type of stalking, the predatory stalker stalker is what ends in sexual assault in particular. Um, the stalking is instrumental but also gratifying for those stalkers, uh, the predatory stalker, because they enjoy the sense of power and control that they have from targeting someone, um, a fearful victim, but also one that they are very sexually attracted to. And that type of stalker is terrifying. The group of psychologists who did the study created the Stalking Tactics Scales, or the STS test. That's the, re- the ultimate res- uh, result from this research. The STS is a set of two scales. One scale measures stalking victimization, and then the other perpetration. Each scale includes 22 potential stalking behaviors and asks about the frequency of each one during a period of unwanted pursuit of a victim. The stalking tactics scales also, they gather information about the duration of the overall episode, and then they use a research-informed combination of the number of behaviors experienced, the duration of the behavior, and then the impact on the target uh, for the victimization scale on the other side. And they determine when stalking is most likely to be present. And again, this is a wonderful system that is growing in popularity across the country. A lot of uh, law enforcement departments across the country are starting to kind of take this model in terms of being able to provide risk assessment for women or men, but let's face it, mostly women who come to them and say that they are being stalked. But unfortunately, as I stated very early on in this episode, that the legislation that we have on the books has not quite matched the research in academia available on stalking. I wish I could go into detail on the uh, stalking tactics sta- uh, scales, the the questionnaire and the system that they have, but it is actually kept relatively private except for heinously expensive uh, fees for workshops and things like that. But it is very, very fascinating. And it's very, it's, it's wonderful that someone, uh, especially uh, psychological uh, psychologists, powerhouses, have been studying this and trying to really provide a better model for assessing risk for stalking victims. Because not only is stalking an indicator of other forms of violence, but it's been linked to femicide, which is the murder of women and and girls. 76% of women murdered by an intimate partner were stalked first. Again, 76% of women who were murdered by an intimate partner were stalked first. 85% of women who have survived murder attempts were stalked. 89% of femicide victims who had also been physically assaulted before their murder were stalked within the last year prior to their murder. Again, guys, almost 90% of female murder victims who had been physically assaulted before their murder were also stalked. And lastly, 54% of femicide victims, again, women or girls who've been murdered, reported stalking to the police before they were killed by their stalkers. The overlap here is fucking astonishing. So many women who are murdered were stalked. But now let's move on to technology. There have... And this is terrifying because more is a number that I stated earlier on in this episode, 
more than twice as many victims are stalked with technology than without. That is a massive discrepancy. And as new technology comes out, so we see new methods of stalking, law enforcement and laws on the books, legislation can't keep up with it. I feel personally like there's this almost ethical or moral obligation um, for some of these technology companies but they're but they're not. They're not operating that way. Currently, they're operating in terms of capitalism, how much money they can make, and fuck the everyday people. It doesn't matter how the ulterior motives or additional purposes that these things can be used. So, you know, there have been instances of men, and it is usually men, utilizing child safety and monitoring apps for nefarious purposes. These apps are easily downloadable from the App Store. It doesn't matter if you have an iPhone, you're sitting there with an Android, you know, Apple App Store, Google Play, whatever. These apps are intended for parents wanting to keep tabs on what their children are doing online. I have multiple mom friends who utilize these apps to make sure that they keep their children safe online. You know, of course, the software can be used to digitally eavesdrop on adults as well not that hard to put this, especially when we're talking about family relationships, husband, wife, girlfriend, boyfriend, whatever, intimate relationships, for someone to snag someone's phone while they're in the shower, take three minutes to download the app, pop it on, and then there you have it. They have full access to your iCloud, to your Facebook Messenger, to your Snapchat, to your Instagram. They have access to your whole waking life and every key that you move on, your you select on your phone. Not only that, but even an app as innocuous as Google Maps, that can be transformed into a stalking tool. I will never forget, I mean, this was years ago, like probably 10 or more plus years ago, when I located the Google Maps option on my email, in my 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 Gmail address, and I somehow came across tri- the trips function. And I almost shit my pants when I saw that it had been collecting my data for five years and literally showed lines around everywhere that I had driven on a daily basis for five years. It had been collecting that information on me. It showed all around Maine where I lived. It showed all my trips to Boston, the flights that I took. It literally showed my phone going across the country on flights or out of the country for flights um, in France and stuff. It tracked me for five full years, and I had no idea that that was a setting in my Gmail that I could just turn off. Now, God forbid I had had a stalker at that point. If someone could get into my email, which it's there's so many different ways and tools that people can get into email, whether locally or online, they easily could secretly have gone into my map settings and seen exactly where I where I was going, where I went, what my home address was. Someone may not have even had to have known where I was living, but they could have found that information simply by getting into my email address. And with how many people on the black, on the dark web, and just people in general can get your email addresses or guess a password if it's not created strongly enough, that's terrifying. And a lot of people aren't tech savvy enough to realize that that's even an option, or they don't know what they're doing and turn it on. It's, it's, it's really kind of a diabolical thought. And then we have something that has been bothering me for quite some time now, and that's Apple AirTags. Last December, Canadian law enforcement announced that AirTags were being found in luxury vehicles to later be stolen. However, after that, numerous stories have come out and surfaced on social media of women finding AirTags hidden in their belongings. Absolutely terrifying. Just last month on December 6th, two women actually came forth and sued Apple. They're saying that the AirTag tracking devices in the hands of stalkers are inherently dangerous. They are claiming that Apple failed to heed warnings from advocacy groups and news reports. One woman found an AirTag in her child's backpack while she was going through a very violent and contentious divorce. She, um... Her ex-husband, whom she was separated from, they shared custody against her her desire for that. Uh, He had physically abused her many times in the past, but again, he she was forced to share custody of her children. Uh, She he always knew where she was. He would randomly confront her about places that she went. Why were you there? Who were you with? And she could not understand how he knew that information. 
So she actually went through her child's backpack when, um, you know, when you pack your child's um, backpack, you'll put maybe a lunchbox or canteen or, you know, whatever their little lunchboxes. He had actually placed an air tag in his child's lunchbox and wrapped it up in a, t- in a towel so that she couldn't hear the beeping noise of it. And she found that. Another woman actually found an air tag taped to the underside of her wheel well. This was done by a stranger. And I'm not sure how many of you have seen an air tag, have an air tag, or know how this works. The original meaning of them, it's a little bit bigger than a quarter, so it's pretty small. And the entire purpose of it is, hey, you can put this on any item so that you always know where it is. You know if it's getting away from you. Um, most commonly, it'll be something like car tags or your car, uh, your car keys, rather, things like that. Remote control, like absolutely anything. Luggage, whatever. So that was the original purpose of it. So currently, iPhone users will get a notification if an AirTag is separated from its owner, the owner that it's registered to, and it's it's moving with them over time. So let's say that I drop my car keys somewhere. I have an AirTag on my car keys. I drop my car keys. I will get a notification if it is separated from me and I walk a certain uh, distance away from it. Android users can't receive these notifications automatically. They can buy an Apple AirTag and they can register it and use it, um, but they can't actually get the notifications automatically. Apple did release an application called Tracker Detect that will allow them to scan for AirTags. But here's the thing, guys. These things have... (laughs) Stalkers and people with nefarious intent have begun to use AirTags frequently. And people are finding, especially again, hate to say it, but women especially, are finding air tags, say, in their purses. They go to a bar, a man is hitting on them, and she leaves. Suddenly she finds an air tag in her purse that was left there so that he can stalk her and watch her air tag move and follow her and locate her home. Like that's the type of ways that these are being used. Well, Android users, because they don't have iPhones, haven't been able to easily identify when there is an AirTag. AirTags, when they separate from the registered user, they beep, they make noise. So Apple did, in fact, come out with a tracker detect app that will scan for an unknown AirTag and alert them. However, tracker detect only works when the app is open. And even then, it takes a little bit of time for it to register the presence of an AirTag, an unwanted AirTag at that, or an unknown AirTag. So anyone who's alerted to the presence of an unknown AirTag, whether it's through Apple's direct system um, or tracker detect, they can trigger a chime to help them locate the device itself. So I highly suggest everyone downloads that. If you have an iPhone, obviously you're probably going to become aware or hear it. Um, If you have an Android phone, for your own safety, download Tracker uh, tracker Detect. Uh, But it's absolutely insanity that this is even a thing here in 2023 where women are being stalked by these little quarter-sized devices. Vice News actually did a really fascinating article on air tags and family law, and it pertains primarily to California. And I find that particularly relevant for this episode because, A, I would say my biggest listener base, most of you, well, not most of you, but a a good chunk of you actually live in California. So I'm going to go ahead and discuss this for a second. So California law states that, quote, no person or entity in this state shall use an electronic tracking device to determine the location or movement of a person. But the thing about it, guys, is that there are aspects of stalking through air tags that make it harder for married people to get recourse on stalking or even just partners, not even just married, but partners. Let's say that you as a a woman are an abusive, physically violent relationship with a man. Let's say that the two of you share a vehicle. He may have bought the vehicle or bought you the car. You haven't transferred or bought it or whatever. He has the legal right to leave a tracking device in that car if you share it. And if that car is registered in his name, then the law does not apply. So in the case of the woman who was stalked by her ex-husband, Let's say that if her husband owned the car, he has every right to leave a tracking device in it and utilize that information. 
In these types of cases, it can be nearly impossible to prove in a court of law that the target was being stalked at all. So even if he is leaving that air tag in there with the explicit purpose of stalking his ex, knowing every single movement that she makes to be able to confront her, know where she is, control her, whatever, it does not matter if his name is on that title of registration. That is purely legal. And not just in California, but we're seeing that in many, 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 many other states as well. And it is becoming a larger problem. In April, the news outlet Motherboard actually obtained records requests mentioning air tags from eight of the largest police departments all across the country. And the majority of reports, like nine out of 10 of them, came from women. Of the 50 that reported finding out that they were being tracked through an air tag, 25 could identify a man close to them, like an ex-partner, estranged husband or boyfriend, that they suspected placed the device to follow them in the first place. And the problem with this is that once it's reached this point, once it's reached the stage where a woman in particular usually, I will say that until the day that I die, fears for her safety. She fears that the level of stalking has escalated to the point where she feels that she is personally unsafe. And, you know, they reach out to law enforcement and say, hey, please help. At this point, this is the danger moment. This is the danger phase. This is when she's typically in the greatest amount of danger. And I'm sure all of you have heard of cases where, I mean, even earlier I mentioned it in one case where someone is being stalked, whether it's typically through an acquaintance or an ex, but maybe, hey, it's through a stranger at all. And going to law enforcement is fruitless. They tell you, well, we can't do anything unless they commit a crime. Not always true, but a lot of law enforcement, they just simply don't want to deal with it because it is such a gray area of he said, she said, and it's messy. But there are laws on the book, so make sure to advocate for yourself with all of these different uh, technologies and and, uh, things being used. So what can you do? First, I suggest visiting a resource like Spark, S-P-A-R-C. That is the Stalking Prevention Awareness and Resource Center. Um, It's a federal organization that basically does research on stalking. It provides in-person trainings, online resources, individual and organizational assistance. Uh, It assists with policy and protocol development at the legislative legislative level. Uh, It does webinars. It does a lot of different uh, things. Spark helps victim services criminal justice, court personnel, and then also campus life staff at universities, which my particular stalking story came, I'll tell my story in a moment, but it happened on a university campus. So find your resources first and uh, first of all. Secondly, if you feel that you are in danger or you feel like you are actually being uh, stalked for, and you feel like you are in danger, call, call 911, call the police if you feel like you are in immediate danger. If you feel like someone is following you or not, they haven't necessarily escalated to the point where you feel unsafe quite as of yet, uh, make sure to provide evidence. uh, Keep track of it, whether it's CCTV camera footage, emails, keep all evidence of all correspondence, keep copies of all text, phone records, emails, text messages, all of it, social media messages. Keep track of all of it. And A lot of it now, due to the nature of the world that we live in, is online. A lot of it is online. And I can't help again but think about Xana and Kaylee and Maddie and Ethan, particularly the three girls, because it seems like they were most likely the the primary targets of Brian Koberger. But social media is so dangerous. I mentioned in one of the previous episodes that I have a friend who's daughter, unfortunately, was in fact groomed by an online pedo, um, lack of a better term, multiple of them actually, and did actually end up um, being sexually assaulted multiple times. Um, Absolutely horrifying. Online, our online presence provides so much more information than you know. I am so guilty of this myself. I talk about the deepest, darkest details of my life. I have tried to curate a social media presence um, and friends list that is generally people that I know or I feel safe with. None of that matters. I feel I've, I've always felt relatively safe on my social media, but I'm not in any capacity. Not at all. Um, 
it doesn't matter because the tools that we have, well, that criminals have at their disposal these days or people who are unhealthy, they're able to bypass that. They're able to bypass our boundaries, our controls, passwords, things like that. Technology is not infallible. So, you know, again, going back to Brian Koberger and how he ended up stalking and finding out about the girls, obviously that is nothing but pure speculation. We don't know as of yet. We don't know anything beyond the People magazine article that they released, apparently against their better judgment that he followed them on Instagram. But I have you ever had a friend who got a new boyfriend or went on a date or matched with someone on Tinder? Um, I had a friend that did that about five years ago, and she matched with a guy. She's middle aged. She matched with a guy on Tinder, and she's like, "Hey, do any of my friends have you know background check system, or you know, are you really good at digging through social media? Can you help me find this guy? I want to know who I'm about to go on a date with." Because remember, a very inherent um, common part of the female ex- experience is that we actually have to fear for our lives and safety when we go on blind dates or uh, dating apps. If you think that's being that's me talking crazy or being unrealistic, there are dozens of TV shows or series out there showing you cases where women have been drugged, raped, and or murdered um, for online dating. But I digress. Anyway, I reached out, you know, I'm like, hey, you know, I have my my podcast. I have, um, you know, background check stuff that I use on cases and things like that. What's his information? I utilized, uh, been verified. I got this guy's name uh, and his age, not even his full name, his first name, last initial and his age. I was able to locate his Facebook profile. From there, I was able to put him into a uh, identity check database and found out that he had actually killed his wife 15 years before. She was about to go on a date with a man who had murdered his own wife 15 years before, and he had just recently got out of prison and did not divulge any of that information to her. That was one of the most batshit experiences of my life. Thank God people, you know, a lot of women have each other's backs and just on the front front and um, help them with things like that. But can you imagine going out with a, on, a, on a blind date, on an online uh, date, I guess, with some man who had just killed his wife or just gotten out of prison for killing his wife? Just Jesus Christ. So the information that we put on social media is easily able to be found. And again, I go back to Brian Koberger with, okay, he ran into Maddie at the Mad Greek, had her first name, or at least knew what she looked like. He could then go to the Mad Greek, go through all the profiles who've done likes, easily locate, say, her Facebook page. From there, he has a first and last name. From there, he can find her on Instagram. From there, he can see if she's tagged location in any of the pictures. He can look if he's familiar with the areas and places that she's taken pictures. He then locates that she's a university student, which he likely, you know, probably could have guessed to begin with. There are so many different ways for people to make assumptions, inferences, whatever, about your life solely from social media. So be careful on it. Don't post your life story. Um, Be careful with what you post. Be selective with your friend request. If you don't know the person, decline that invitation. I was the world's worst after the election. I think a lot of you know that I'm pretty far left. So um, after the Trump election, I'm sure a lot of you have heard of uh, a lot of the you know women's groups and whatnot who who banded together pantsuit nation type of stuff. I it was like a, a a Facebook feeding frenzy of us accepting friend requests from women that we thought were allies and felt the same way that we did. I have since unfriended ninety nine point nine nine percent of them. Um, keep it strictly to your own known family or people that you know, such as friends and real life colleagues. Again, don't post any of your personal information up to and including your actual address, credit card, phone numbers. I used to have my phone number on my Facebook account way back in the day. And not only does that make it easier for criminals to steal my identity and get into my stuff, uh, you know, dupe my phone number and get some passwords to say forgot password, have that text message sent directly to that duped phone number. I mean, it's asinine, right? Uh, Something that I see a lot of people do, especially on Facebook, is sharing their travel plans. A lot of people, myself again guilty, share your vacation pictures. 
I'm going to be gone from 5 p.m. on Friday. When I get off of work, I'm so glad to leave and go to the airport. I'm not going to be back in my home until next you know, next Thursday at 6 p.m. My flight lands at 4 a.m. I will be home later that afternoon. There are people, whole groups of people who just surf the internet to search to see when you will be gone so that they can obviously not only burglarize your home, but also, um, you know, potentially stalk you as well or get into your home with the sole purpose of stalking. And I think it goes without saying to use the strongest privacy settings as a whole. Um, Two-factor authorization is a big one. And I thought that this was bullshit. And until my PlayStation got hacked a couple years ago, it got hacked twice. Um, a lot of you know that I'm a huge gamer. I play all the time. I'm like, I don't need you know 2FA. It's a pain in the ass. It is an absolute pain in the ass to go through that additional added layer of security. I love lazy. I love easy. I don't want to have to deal with all that. Then my PlayStation got hacked and taken over by someone. I think it was like in Mexico or Nicaragua, South America, somewhere. And then also again in the Middle East. And I was locked out of my PlayStation for a month. And that made me very upset. Uh, so since then, I have put 2FA on basically everything. Uh, so basically, it's and a lot of banking systems have actually gone to that now, where if you want to log in or get information about something, they'll deliver you a text message with that little you know, code. Um, sometimes they use a third party app or authenticator like Google Authenticator. Um, I also learned my lesson back in 2015. I wrote an article um, a political, uh, well, not an article, a Facebook post. I wrote a very politically charged Facebook post and it went viral. It got like 200,000 shares. And guys, thank God I had 2FA on my Facebook account because I was sitting at work that later that morning. Uh, I wrote the, the, the Facebook page early that, uh, or, blah, I wrote the Facebook post early that morning and I was sitting in my engineering job and my phone was blowing the fuck up. I mean, blowing the fuck up. And it was all of these attempts of people trying to get into my Facebook account. They were trying to hack me. And I would sit there and hold my phone in my hand. And my coworkers and I were like, holy shit. I had hundreds of attempts throughout that morning of people trying to get that uh, 2FA code delivered so that they could hack into my account. And it was nuts. I got death threats the whole bit. I that was the that was the day that I decided to lock down my Facebook account for the most part. And I waffle back and forth and I'm I'm dumb and I will unlock it and lock it and unlock it and lock it. Um, but that was a very humbling, scary experience to receive death threats, um, dozens of death threats, and then hundreds of attempts at trying to hack your stuff. Um, but yeah, make sure that you ha- take security very, 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 very seriously. Uh, another thing is make sure you use a different password for each one of your accounts. Again, if you're like me, I love lazy. I will try to use the same password for everything. Seriously, if someone got one of my passwords, they would wipe out my whole life potentially, uh, ruin my credit the whole bit. Um, don't do that. Use a different password for all of your social accounts. Um, stalking, cyber stalking is growing in popularity so much. It's just easier if you use a different password for each one. You can use a password generator, um, a strong password. Don't use, you know, ABC123. Uh, thankfully, a lot of sites aren't even allowing that to begin with, but make sure you use those types of systems. <clears throat> if you go out a lot, I do suggest you downloading one of the AirTag tracker systems. And that's just for peace of mind. You know, be aware whether you have an iPhone or an Android just search for it. If you like to go out to bars and drinking and stuff, you know, unfortunately, those are a little bit higher risk places. So just take the extra precaution and make sure do occasional scan to see if you have been tracked. Obviously, chances are you have not been right. Chances are pretty good that this didn't happen to you. But I fall into the let's be safe rather than sorry later on camp. I'm always very cognizant when I drive to see if anyone is following me. I know that sounds absolutely insane. In a previous episode, I've talked about 
two instances, like it's three, two instances um, where I've been, I've had some problems and that's, I caught a man trying to break into my house. I've discussed that. And then also after I got my lab puppy back in like 2015 or so, um, I was driving home and there was a man very, and very obviously following me. I turned around, looked through my rear view mirror. He looked like freaking Richard Ramirez. He was terrifying. I turned down side streets. I made very weird turns all around the place and he followed me everywhere that I went. Uh, luckily I was later on able to use him since that day. I, before that day, I just, I just happened to look out, see that he was following me. I'd never checked before in my life. So Make sure that you are cognizant of your surroundings, whether you're walking, driving, running, whatever. Change your daily routines, like the time or the routes that you're going to work, the gym, restaurants, whatever. Know the location, and this is another big one, know the location of the closest police station to you or those along the routes that you frequently travel. (laughs) Make sure that you are aware of where they are, just in case you need to stop there for safety purposes. Also keep a list of critical phone numbers, including emergency services and other support organizations. Make sure that you are able to speed dial them on your cell phone if you need help. Make sure that your phone number is unlisted. Um, I think a lot of us are very surprised. Like if you type in your cell phone number, sometimes if you just Google your own cell phone number, sometimes if you've ever put an ad up for work or like a Craigslist, you know, trying to sell a piece of furniture even or a car or applying to a um a for sale ad. Sometimes your phone number actually comes up with your full name. You'll find the listing and the the website for that listing. There's your cell phone number and there's your first and last name. So now that person has your phone number if they've been looking for yours specifically. And then just a couple self-defense and self-protection items. Um you know, I discussed this in an earlier episode as far as why women are into true crime, and it's because a lot of studies have shown that it's a cathartic experience for us because women are so much more frequently victimized in certain ways. So say, for example, a very um, common experience is say you work, you get off late, and you have to walk across a dark parking lot outside or a dark parking garage, get an escort to your car when you leave work, or get a personal duress alarm. Um, Maybe take up self-defense if you don't feel like you are able to protect yourself in the way that you would like. Uh, Sign up if you can afford it with your car so that if you have um, car problems or if someone tampered with your car or gave you a flat tire, that you'll be able to call someone immediately so that they can come assist you. Uh, regularly check for tracking devices again, especially with the air tag stuff. And you say, go out to clubs or parties and, you know, more so in, into that type of scene, make sure that you're able to check for that sort of thing because of the prevalency of it now. And again, it, the, the, the fraction of that happening is very low, but still again, rather be safe than sorry. If you are experiencing a stalking situation what, or having domestic issues with your partner and they are trying to control or stalk you, Make sure if you have children that the child's school, daycare, that their system is aware of the situation. Make sure that they are aware of what you are experiencing so that, God forbid, they don't try to take the children or impact a family member of yours. Make sure you always have your cell phone on you. Um, I am attached to my phone at the hip, but I have had friends who hate cell phones, so they're always dead or they can't get a hold of them especially when they're at home. Make sure you have a safety plan in place of how to exit the home or where you can go in your home if something were to happen or someone were to show up. And unfortunately, you know, the statistic, 11% of women who are stalked, 11% of women have to move. They actually have to move. If that is the case and you actually have to leave your, your area entirely to get away from a stalker, make sure that when you do and you're preparing to move, that you take all possible measures that you erase your traces, that you cannot be traced to your new location. A big part for me is home security. I am obsessed with home security. My house is like Alcatraz. No, that's not a challenge. Change your locks. Install extra deadbolts, uh, window locks. Uh, Install sensor lights that are beyond reach of someone to just come up and take them off or cover them. Uh, I keep my front life, I have my front lights, I have spotlights on. Um, so, you know, keep those 
bright at night or illuminate your yard so that it's harder for someone to say stand in front of your house or try to get in. Uh, obviously the same things like fire alarms and things like that. Um, backup battery. Um, some people get people in their doors, although I believe at this point that's more common in apartments, um, remove hiding places such as bushes. There have been countless sort of situations where people did the, um, you know, someone would come up to your door at two in the morning, help. I've been in a car wreck. Can I use your phone? And then if you even engage them or open your door, here's two other people coming in to push past you to, um, assault or burglarize your home. Um, you don't want hiding places. You don't want someone to be able to get into your home or hide. Um, I've discussed the instance where the man was trying to break into my house. He was behind some bushes in the front of my house. He was literally using those tall bushes to get up next to the windows, trying to get into the windows. Uh, don't leave any ladders around the side of your house. People, it's amazing to me. I'll draw, I'll drive through my subdivision. I live in a very residential neighborhood and I will see people who have 12, 15 foot ladders, 20 foot ladders leaned up against their house and just leave it there for months at a time. Like, hello, no, thank you. That's kind of like an open invitation. Here's the key. I'm good. Um, you know, some people, if you are being stalked or you have fears of being stalked, get a P.O. box um, or at least have a lock on your letter box that only the post office can put a letter in and you have to use your key to get it out. A lot of times people, stalkers, will go to a victim's mail and go through their mail and find names of people who are messaging them, account numbers. They can get other information that way. Obviously, you can get a dog. A lot of women that I know have German shepherds in particular. Um, I think uh, Belgian Malinois, like an, another King Corsos, are a very, very, very popular self protection dogs. Uh, but to get it properly trained by a professional, uh, a lot of people are getting um, animals. If, say, if you live alone, that may be a good uh, you know, decision. Also, highly suggest get a home security check. Uh, I know that my local police station offers this. It's, I, I'm not sure how prevalent it is, but sometimes police stations will offer a free program to come and show you and discuss your home security, any sort of blind spots that they see um, with that. <clears throat> Again, uh, another one is th- shredding all of your paperwork before you throw it out. My mom did this religiously. And I always called her paranoid for it, but now I totally get it after hearing some of these insane stories. It's very common if you have bank statements or just any account stuff in general, um, credit cards, phone records, phone stuff, um, you know, and you just read it. I'm done with it. I'll throw it away. There's your whole life record there in your trash in a bag. Shred that shit before you put it out there so that no one can just piece it together easily. Another one, and this has bugged me since it since it came out. You know the car stickers that's uh, like the family stickers that has the the male or the female, and then all their children and the cat and the dog. Don't do that. Don't do that. That is fucking dumb. Don't do that. You are literally telling someone if they want to burglarize your home or if you have a stalker or whatever, you are telling them what they will find in your home. That I will, you know, I have a husband and I have two children. I have two little girls for that matter. Don't do that. Do not get those stickers. Do not advertise what you have in your home. Don't get any sort of personalized license plates or make your car more easily identifiable. Uh, Another one too, a big piece. I don't, how many have you seen say in your neighborhood or the area where you live where someone will get a customized a uh, nameplate for their mailbox or for their yard. Welcome to the Johnsons. Welcome to the Daniels, you know, whatever. Um, don't do that. You're giving away your last name and making it so easy that someone just has to drive by your residence. And then there they see Mary Sue's name right in the front yard. Don't do that. You don't want any sort of personalized name or, you know, to make it easier. You want to be less identifiable. And I know that I'm just going through a laundry list of items here, but last but not least, guys, make sure that your internet safety, that you have a firewall, you're protected against viruses and so forth. Because again, with technology coming, it's not just air tags. It's the ability with hacking programs and viruses and the phishing scams and all sorts of stuff. Stalkers, whether it's intimate or non-intimate stalkers, have utilized many, many, many of these techniques. Uh, Also, frequently, uh, 
a lot of these antivirus programs will also check for key, check for key loggers and things like that. If someone got into your computer, whether um, you know on site or remotely, and installed a key logger. Um, fun story for that. I once had a very psychotic ex who we lived together and she actually installed a key logger on my laptop because she thought that I was cheating on her. Um, and so she had a key logger on my computer. I wasn't cheating on her, but I found the key logger and that was one of the most betrayed moments of my entire life at that point. Um, but yeah, people can do that. Imagine a stranger with ill intentions getting a keylogger on your computer and documenting and getting an email with every single letter that you've typed on your computer. What kind of information would they find? If you are being stalked, it's also imperative that you collect evidence. Proof is crucial in building a case against a stalker. And that cannot be overstated in any way, shape, or form, especially considering law enforcement doesn't want to do their jobs in stalking cases a lot of the times. Again, Polly Perrette, a very well-known, I believe she's an Emmy-nominated, Emmy Emmy-winning actress, they basically told her, well, he's going to have to break your arm before we can really do anything about it. Um, terrifying, right? You don't want to get that far. So compile a journal of all of the events that have taken place from the very first, first moment. Um, did a breakup happen? When did he start calling you? Um, has he sent you gifts, left messages, driven by your home, knocked on your door, come to your work? Get that done. Organize a paperwork filing system. Get copies of the police reports if you've made them. Hard copies of emails, phone records. Make sure you tell all of your family and friends. Make it very, very known. Do not isolate yourself on this. Do not um, hide this from anyone out of shame or embarrassment because it is not your fault if you are uh, stalked. While you are doing this, though, make sure you don't scribble down on things and then throw it in your trash. Um, be very cognizant of what you do put out in the trash. And last but not least, again, I will say this until the day that I die, cameras. I love my security cameras. My home is completely, completely reviewed. Um, I find that in being one of the most, the, the best deterrents as a whole for home, home defense, really, and home security, um, that it can be so important if you are finding yourself in a stalking uh, situation as well. Report it to police, report it repeatedly to police, go with someone else if possible, and try to present the evidence to them in a very collated, organized way, chronological as, way, as well. Know the anti-stalking legislation ap applicable to your jurisdiction. Um, there are so many places online where you can find a list of stalk anti-stalking laws and what your city and your local jurisdiction, what the definition is and what that entails. Um, earlier on in the episode, I mentioned the six psychologists who came up with a system for risk assessment. They also identified a list of mistakes that victims make. And these include things like providing too much information about themselves to people they don't know, not giving a clear or calm message that they're not interested in a relationship. I know that the you know there's kind of the trope of playing hard to get uh leading people on you know we see shows like catfish all the time where someone and it's really easy to do online to um to make a connection with someone and then you kind of lead them on right or you flirt with them with absolutely zero intention of forming a deeper relationship with them not everybody is quite right up right upstairs guys so you know Worst case scenario there, someone could become simple obsessed or uh, become that re uh, rejected lover. Don't do that. Do not give, if you are not interested in someone, give them a very clear, firm answer and statement that you are not interested in pursuing anything more. A lot of people, especially women, I find, they don't listen to that inner voice, the, the that intuition. I feel like uh, women are kind of conditioned and not to do that. But make sure you listen to your intuition there. Ignoring the early warning signs, too, if you have a partner who shows little glimpses of control, jealousy, or flashes of anger or abuse, don't ignore that. Those are all very, very, very important pieces. I've had friends who have been stalked actively that have tried to help, especially my younger uh, early 20s, and they're like, oh, he's fine. He's harmless. Like, honey, he has sat outside your house for hours today. You know, this is the sixth day in a row where he's done it, or he's called you over 200 times in the last hour. That's that's pretty serious, and that's really frightening. So make sure you're taking that situation clearly, uh, seriously. 
Furthermore, after you've made it very, very clear to the stalker at least one time that you do not, you want them to cease contact, you do not want them to continue contacting you in any way, do not try to reason or bargain with them. Do not try to do that. That could escalate. That could be unsafe. Do not do that. And also, a lot of victims don't take adequate privacy and safety precautions. I've spent like the last 10 minutes now going over some really great pieces, um, some really great ways that you can potentially protect your privacy and safety. Another common thing that happens is that women will not get protective orders or restraining orders because they are afraid of the potential consequences. So I don't want to make him more angry or it's not that serious. Don't push that off. If you're in fear for your safety, get that protective order, get that restraining order, full stop and period. Again, a lot of women will fail to tell their friends uh, or even coworkers or their family, their parents, their friends. Lastly, and most importantly, probably being the police, make sure you obtain support from others, whether it's personally, professionally, on law enforcement side, whatever. You do not need to go through something like that alone. And last but not least, a really interesting point that this group of psychologists made is that women will get a weapon and then it is used against them. For example, a woman feels unsafe in her home, decides to buy a handgun, uh, and doesn't take the correct precautions in order to secure it, and then it is eventually used against her as well. Um, You know, if you are, I'm not anti-gun. I am against our nation's children being shot up like sardines in trash cans in schools, which is absolutely revolting, but a completely different topic as well. Home defense and personal defense can utilize arm weapons, handguns, shotguns, whatever. They can be used for home defense and and personal protection. Do not, if you go, say you fear for your safety for whatever reason, go get a handgun and then leave it unsecured. Don't tell anyone about it. Um, You know, there have been cases that I've read about where a woman will get a handgun, doesn't secure it, leaves it out, and then someone breaks into her home, grabs the gun, and then uses it against her. And that's not just only in stalking cases. That's, God, look at what East Area Rapist did back in the 70s. He did that as well. He would break into a home, grab the person's gun, empty the chamber of bullets, and have that gun or be able to turn it on them um, and utilize that for his uh, sexual assaults and whatnot. But that was their gun that they had in the home for personal protection. Don't let it be that. If you get a home, a gun for home protection, learn how to use it, learn how to properly secure it as well. But that's it for today, guys. Thank you so much for listening. Really appreciate it. The Moscow, Idaho case just really disturbed me to no end when we found out that he was stalking them. And then I wanted to do some more research on that. I always wanted for this podcast not to just be a, a new series or relay uh, case updates, but also a resource to try to be as helpful as possible. And, you know, stalking is terrifying. I've been through it myself. Um, again, like I said earlier, luckily it didn't end in escalated violence, but it was very, very, very scary for about a month there for me. And reaching out to other friends and doing the call to action on sharing your stories, most female friends that I have have a stalking story. And that's so disheartening. Um, but Funnily enough, I discovered that January is actually Stalking Awareness Month as well. Did you learn anything new from this episode or hear anything you hadn't heard of yet? Have you had an experience with Apple AirTags or someone trying to stalk you? If you want to share your stalking story, you can't. You absolutely can. Reach out to info at We Sell the Devil. You can also uh, message us on one of our social media sites as well. But that's it for today, guys. Thank you once again for joining I'm your host, Robin. You've been listening to We Saw the Devil, and I will see you next week. Until next crime.